The Virtual Conference Live Talks is the brainchild of Dov Benyakov Kurtzman. It was initially developed as an emergency education channel to help professionals and general public manage their emotional and psychological response to the pandemic of 2020 by hosting the world's leading psychologists, researchers and authors and providing a platform for nano live workshops. It is now expanded into becoming a showcase for people to share their work and ideas in order to educate and inspire us to follow our own personal paths of value. Now please welcome your host, Dov Ben Yaakov Kurtzman. Wow, hello and welcome to another virtual conference live talks with myself, Dov Ben Yaakov Kurtzman. And what a climax, what a culmination of weeks of brilliant guests doing their bit to share their knowledge and wisdom and experience to help others, those who are watching, um, with the current pandemic situation and distresses that we're all going through, including my guests. My guest now is uh, Professor Stephen Hayes, and I could say lots and lots about uh, Stephen Hayes. I'm going to let him do the formal kind of introduction, you know, more of his academic and his work side. What I would like to say is what my relationship with Stephen Hayes is and why he is so important to me personally. And apart from his brilliance and his uh, academic uh, qualifications and his building a wonderful uh, organization worldwide and being one of the leading psychologists, for me, Stephen Hayes is more than just that. For me, Stephen Hayes is a model of generosity. And uh, it was he's so generous that made an absolute mark in me and was a model for me to go out and do that to others. And that's basically where this series of talks comes from. It's about being generous, it's about giving without um, necessarily expecting anything in return. And my experience with him was when I was doing my master's degree and my supervisor said, why don't you do some research on ACT? And ACT I really hadn't heard of. Um, and so when I did a little bit of uh, research, I came up with the name Stephen Hayes and I wrote to him. And this was about seven years ago, six or seven years ago now and told him what my plans were, never really expecting to get a reply from such a prestigious professor. But not only did I get a reply, I got a long reply, and I got a reply telling me all about him and the fact that I was um, writing to him from Israel and his connect connection to being Jewish and what Israel would mean to him. But not only that, he flooded me with old research and old papers and everything that he could possibly find uh, in his computer to help me get on my way when I was uh, working uh, as a volunteer in a dual diagnosis ward. And that was where I wanted to research with ACT. That flood of generosity um, took me by surprise. Because up until then, any kind of modality of psychology that I had been working with, and I'd been working with a few, always wanted to put me through these type of certification programs before I could actually even get to somebody. But this kind of open source um, model that Stephen Hayes came up with, I saw that actually it had filtered down into everybody in the community. And so when I went to workshops and I went to universities for uh, lectures and all these people that were involved with this ACBS community all had this generosity of giving and giving and giving. And I couldn't help but take that on board. And so um, not only that, but the work I've been trying to do in Israel and to trying to promote ACT, Stephen Hayes has been right behind me every minute. Any time that I've asked him for an interview, he has always just said, when is it? And even at one point, it took me six months to talk to him because I was so confused. I didn't know what I was going to ask him. And he said to me, do you know how to have a conversation? And I said, yeah. He said, so let's just have 
a conversation. That, to me, is Stephen Hayes. That's what it means. Um, and so without uh, further ado, I'm going to ask um, Professor Stephen Hayes to come in from the Green Room and join us for another virtual conference. So welcome, welcome to the virtual conference, Professor Stephen Hayes. I'm so, so appreciative of your time to come here. Well, I'm very pleased to be here with you and I enjoyed sitting in the green room and listening to your introduction, it was very sweet. So um, the reason why I invited you among uh, other guests, especially from the ACBS uh, community was that the world's gone through a pandemic. It's a, it's a first basically that we've, at least in our generation, we've experienced something like that. It's certainly a first that uh, the world has basically closed down its economy in one way or another. Um, and so it brings all sorts of uncertainty, whether it's a health uncertainty, whether it's worry for family and friends, whether it's economical uncertainty, or whether it's just, you know, as we're kind of, some countries are beginning to move out of this lockdown situation, there's that uncertainty of, you know, going out into the big world again, you know, and, and what, what it's actually going to mean for us and what's been kind of called or the new norm, whatever, whatever that will mean. Um, and so what I wanted to do was to invite people that I knew and trusted that could share some of their knowledge, experience, and ultimately the wisdom that they've accumulated with the people that are watching this. Um, and it came in the end to invite the top of the pyramid, what I would say, or the, the originator, which is you, which is yourself, because I see and constantly return and use it every day of my life, which is uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. It's really helped me personally and it continues to help me. Um, so, but before we get, um, you know, into the, the, the program tonight, you are in exactly the same situation as all of us. And so what I like to ask my guests is, you know, how did Stephen Hayes, get through this, you know, from a personal point of view, how do you do it? Well, I am here sheltered in place with my family and it's been a challenge, I think, uh, in some ways, a very interesting one because you kind of find yourself focusing on uh, things in a different way. Uh, I'm doing a whole lot of uh, uh, Zoom meetings and things of that kind. I'm running my classes that way. I'm supervising my students that way. Um, you know, I'm involved with uh, podcasts. I, I, I was working on a, a new uh, online course, ended up instead of doing it in the studio, it's all being done this way, etc. So it's been quite an interesting set of uh, challenges and opportunities. A little more time uh, uh, with my family, of course. Uh, my 14-year-old went through quite a little shift there. <laughs> uh, you know, how is he gonna survive with uh, without hanging out with his friends? And it turns out uh, very well uh, inside the, the virtual world. You wonder what it must have been like with the uh, you know, the 1918 uh, flu epidemic and stuff where people had to shelter in place with nothing other than rumors and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, no act, contact with the outside world it must have been really, really difficult. We're uh, blessed in some ways. Here I am talking to you many thousands of miles away, talking to people around the world. So uh, we're interconnected in a way that... Uh, uh, I've taken advantage of it in, in the downtime. Although I, I, you asked sort of how have I, you know, I found myself doing things like uh, in my yard, there's a very nice uh, kind of uh, landscape thing with rocks, you know, it's made to look like a stream. Of course, there's no stream in the desert in Nevada, but um, over the years, uh, it's got completely filled with silt and dirt. And so I found myself on my hands and knees one at a time, removing tens of thousands of rocks and taking the dirt out and then putting them back and saying, oh, how beautiful. And then at some point I'm saying, 
man, this COVID thing, uh, you've got <laughs> a point where it's enjoyable to like move rocks. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks beautiful now. If you come over to my house, you can say, wow, that's that's wonderful. You know, I think, uh, you know, appreciating the small things of being able to watch a movie with your family or to be able to just have a conversation or to sit on the back porch and drink your coffee. And aren't these things that are always important to us, but in the busy, busy go, go, go day, uh, sometimes uh, not given proper attention and due weight. So uh, it, it's been a uh, an awakening in some ways to remembering things that are have always been there and always of importance, but sometimes you forget. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think um, you know personally that it's among all the distress that's going on. It's certainly allowed us another opportunity of to you know the slowing down um, whether we like it or not but we've had this opportunity to what are we going to choose to do because this slowing down has basically been forced upon us and we can choose to to do um things that are useful for us or or not um, I also had an experience I started I, I took up gardening which I've never ever done and so I started to buy these little um, tomato seeds, you know, like yeah, sure. uh, little plastic cups, you know, like maybe I, I, the only last time I remember doing something like that was like, in, I think, in primary school. And um, so I've got a little crop growing now and it's, you know, and I'm looking after it and tending it. And then I bought a few plants here and there and I go out and I water them, you know, and I do. And uh, it's amazing how you can become much more mindful in, in these kind of things that I never had time for before. I never even bothered. I had a garden at four years. I never walked in it. I just went my front door to the street. <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't even go into it. And now it's become another room for me. It's become another place. Well, it's you know, that's happening around the world. And it's not because people are afraid of... Um, you know, running out of food. We, we have a garden in our back and I, we plant it each year and I tend to it. I So I completely redid, redid the drip system and I, you know, dug all the things out and did all those things. Uh, some years I do that, some years I don't. But then I went to get plants and uh, with my mask on and so forth, I went to a, a grocery store that, that also has uh, quite a selection of plants and there was almost nothing there. And it was early, and I'm like, "What?" And it's because there's been a run on on tomato plants, and on I, st I still don't have my zucchini in because uh, I can't find them. And so um, it, I think it's that people uh, are grounded by their connection to nature and to the dirt and to the earth, and to have something to do that's like that, that's sort of primitive. I mean, after all, we, we say things like being grounded, being humble, you know, having our feet on the ground. We have metaphors like that. Humble comes from the word for dirt, right? Humus uh, in, in English. And uh, so I, I, I think we're going back to our roots. There's another metaphor, isn't it? Of, uh, so the gardening is a, a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I'm enjoying our little garden. It's growing very nicely, and the new drip system is perfect. <laughs> I just wish good. that I could get the, I'm putting some new caps so that I can have a little bench come up so I can sit in my garden. And I've created this thing, but I need some special wood to do it exactly right. And so far, I haven't been able to uh, get to the store that does that. It's been closed, but just uh, today or yesterday, today, it opens. So... I'll put my mask on and maybe uh, continue and to venture work. out. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's see. Um, there's some people joining us. Um, we have a Facebook user says, very excited to hear you, Professor Hayes. Shout out from Israel. And thank you again, Dov, for this virtual uh, conference. Um, Kathy Russell from uh, England says, finally managed to catch one of your lives. Oh, yeah. I don't. Um, Limor Attar is uh, watching. I know she's uh, watching uh, from Israel as well. Uh, we've got uh, somebody from uh, Norman Evans from Toronto coming in. Uh, so there's 
fantastic even come we've got people tuning in here from all over the world uh Stephen. um so let's see what else we've got we've got lara fielding um she says cool very excited to tune in um liat says uh that she's also very happy to be here. Carmen, I think she's coming in from Germany. Thank you so much for this today. Um, another uh, Hebrew user says they're getting very excited, which is All fantastic. Right. Um, we have uh, Sharona Cohen. Thank you for this virtual conference. Big honor. Oh, and here we have Amy Murrell. Um, my newest Becca Epps book is about building a garden. Well, there you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Amy, for, for coming in. Amy was with us uh, a few weeks ago already, I think. Yeah, awesome. um, she, was, she was absolutely awesome. Um, we've got somebody else coming in saying, um, good morning, Steve. Sometimes um, their actual names uh, don't come up. But that's the way it is. Sam Vered says, thank you so much from Jerusalem. Well, so we have quite a number from Israel and so forth. Right. And my, uh, my Jewish lineage, and I'm Jewish by the maternal line, although I didn't learn that until I was a teenager because of the sad uh, situation my mother was put in, uh, 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 being raised by uh, uh, a father who converted to Judaism to marry her mother, but then with the rise of German nationalism became a Nazi sympathizer. So there's a wounded uh, side to the, that. And I do hope someday to go to Israel. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to that and to somehow uh, closing the circle of these multi-generational uh, wounds and traumas that have happened in the world and uh, no more dramatically than what happened uh, in the middle part of the last century. Uh, which definitely Absolutely. echoed down through my family with uh, many of my uh, uh, aunts and uncles not making it out of the Holocaust and so forth. But uh, uh, but I have to confess I'm very ignorant about uh, uh, Jewish traditions and stuff because of uh, because of all that. Um, but I, I usually wear a, a bracelet that has written in Hebrew, "This too shall pass." So I've tried to. Uh, uh, very relevant uh, for today, well, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is very <laughs> relevant. And, you know, you were mentioning like, how do you get through. One of the things that is exciting, and I want to talk a little bit about how we can do this and socially extend this, is that you know because of the work of the uh, entire community, the ACT community, we know a lot about how to get through periods like this, not exactly like this, but to do it in a way that produces uh, prosperity instead of trauma. And, uh, you know, really good longitudinal research with getting through violent crimes, uh, violent storms, uh, cancer diagnoses, school shootings, uh, periods of time in quarantine, on and on it goes. So it's not like we come to this worldwide challenge, uh, you know, without knowledge. We, we come not just with cultural wisdom and with our personal wisdom we can bring to it, but also with scientific wisdom. And the uh, contextual behavioral science community has been part of developing that over the last uh, 20, 25 years. And so we're able to say some things that are pretty concrete, I think, about how best to spend some of the time. So in addition to uh, gardening, maybe a little bit of reading about psychological flexibility processes and. Uh, in addition to uh, you know Netflix and uh, movies, maybe a little bit of time uh, working on your own uh, psychological flexibility skills or learning how to socially extend them to your family and to your community. So uh, that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. Yeah, absolutely. I think this uh, whole uh, program is about trying to get over the idea and to learn a little bit and to experience also a little bit of what flat psychological flexibility um, means and what it can do for us and why is it um, even important you know what is that you know why be psychologically flexible I mean what what, what why is that good for us yeah it, it, I think it's a, a good it's a you know really a, a positive story and it's one that allows us to bring kind of Western science 
into this uh, cultural conversation uh, worldwide about how best to step up to this challenge and do so in a way that uh, creates, uh, you know, post-traumatic uh, growth. I mean, there's kind of a traumatic period here where it's an invitation to trauma, but we have to uh, do something for that invitation to turn into trauma and we have an alternative. We can have it turn into post-traumatic growth. And I, I, I think um, that's some of what I wanna talk about today, about how do we do that? I know a number of therapists watch, uh, but also normal, folks and maybe i can talk in ways that would touch both those uh, audiences yeah absolutely i'd like to invite you now to, to do that and um you know i i think i think one of the things that people are very anxious about today including myself is will all this um even though like maybe the um the virus, maybe we'll be, you know, maybe that'll go, or maybe it'll be less, um, you know, uh, dangerous for us, whatever. But will this experience, you know, be traumatic to me all my life? Will, will you know, will this whole experience be traumatic for my children? Um, so, this, you know, the idea of, you know, the choice of whether we can go in that direction of post-traumatic growth, which sounds wonderful, or going through the the not so pleasant um, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, I would like to invite you now to try and take us down that road of the post-traumatic growth, uh, Professor Stephen Ends. Well, we do know that the, these psychological flexibility skills applied to yourself are so important to determining how this is gonna play out. Uh, there's external things, and I do have to say that I'm, in some countries, uh, some of the political leaders and so forth are not so wise. I'm, I may be living in one. In fact, I am living in one. Uh, my wife is uh, Brazilian, and unfortunately, uh, her relatives are living in one as well. There are other countries that have, that have been wiser. And because we do know that getting through a challenge like this is requires things like, you know, accurate information. You don't want to have have a cacophony of contradictory voices here. You want to know something about what's likely to happen. Uh, that, you know, removing those some of the needless uncertainties to best you can and being able to uh, have the resources. There are some people listening, probably live, uh, watching in countries where the resources are very, very stretched and others not so much, and that makes a big difference. But the psychological part makes a difference as well. You know, if, if we can face this challenge in a way that is emotionally open and, and we are able to better treat the natural distress, uncertainty, et cetera, to be able to watch our minds at work, trying to step up to this challenge and to make room for a variety of uh, fears and emotional reactions, you know, lethality, people close to us uh, may be getting sick. You know, I got a call not too long ago from my eldest daughter that she had a fever and had a cough. And of course, you know, I'm fearing the worst. Uh, in fact, she may have gone through, it would lasted long enough and I had enough symptoms. She may have gone through a, uh, uh, an infection, but she never admitted herself to the hospital and thankfully it, it passed. But so we're, we're challenged emotionally, learning how to be more open to that. And then to, you know, come consciously into the present moment with what the situation affords and see the opportunities there, you know, noticing the, the need that uh, your family might have for a conversation or the opportunity to text or call your friends or family or to focus on things that are of importance, uh, uh, such as uh, having some downtime or working on uh, creating beauty or growing that garden, and then be, to be able to find in those moments things that bring meaning and purpose and build habits around that. And those are the psychological flexibility skills. I just said them in a normal tone, but if you know the model, all six are there. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the social challenge because this is a worldwide phenomenon and we are in this odd, odd situation in which we're all in the same boat to a degree and yet we're being required to socially 
uh, distance or physically distance and off into shelter in place and it's now just opening up. So you have this paradox really, uh, or this kind of dialectic of if it's all of us everywhere at the same time that we're isolated. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, what I wanted to do here was to talk a little bit to the therapist, but also folks who've done any kind of reading about uh, act and psychological flexibility, maybe through self-help books or things of that kind. And to talk about how we might dig down to the core yearnings that are inside our inflexibility processes, our flexibility processes, and how they're socially extended. And then I'll do a couple exercises, perhaps, so you can kind of see how this would actually land. I do a fair amount of writing about this only in one place that's in uh, my new book, uh, Liberated Mind. Excuse the commercial, but it is the only place no, that I really, I really dive into um, a, uh, an exploration of the possibility that there's a kind of natural human motivation that's inside the things that we do that create us problems that are inside our avoidance of emotions or our entanglement with thoughts or with our attentional rigidity or our wrapping ourselves around a, a storied self and a compa comparison to others or uh, to be responding uh, impulsively or more based on kind of mindless motivation and building habits around the wrong kinds of things that we really stand for inside those very processes that create so much problem or human yearnings that can be channeled in a new direction and are the real core of what we want even in the things we're doing inside things that are pathological i mean the the, the core idea here is that we're we're coming up with the wrong answers for the right problem Human beings are not deliberately going out and messing themselves up, but they have this evolutionarily recent thing of the logical, judgmental mind, which probably originally does, uh, was uh, evolved for cooperation, but now is turned over into problem solving. And it's turned on us and it's created our lives as a problem to be solved. And if we learn to rein in that mind and then come into the moment, in a way that, that is more in touch with who we really are, we can learn these flexibility skills. And what I want to talk about today is how to take that same yearning and socially extend them. Because this isn't, I mean, act and psychological flexibility is a psychological model. And the psychological level is the whole person living in and with a, a world that's considered both historically and situationally. That's the level of analysis of psychology. But psychology is nested in other levels of analysis. It's nested in small groups and in larger groups. And the world within includes parts of us that are competing one with the other in terms of our repertoire, but also our underlying biology. And even within us, whole ecosystems. I mean, it turns out the data now on what's going on in your gut biome. I mean, there's literally bacteria pulling the little strings to channel into parts of your brain that determine, uh, for example, when you're hungry and for what. Uh, it's really kind of a uh, like a little shop of horrors, you know, feed me is going yeah. on uh, through going on in there isn't there <laughs> yeah, it's like we, you have more cells inside you that are not human than human i mean yeah. that's how dominant an ecosystem it is so we need to think about ourselves in multiple levels and in multiple ways and the one that i wanted to think about today is the small step forward from psychological flexibility to social extension so that in your family or wherever you're sheltered in place and so forth, you might be able to apply these processes to that social extension. But I've written about how to apply it even more into organizations and things of that kind. Some of which I want to talk about is relevant to that, but some of it uh, requires a different level of analysis. You really need to go to a more sociological, political science, anthropological level. And I've tried to do that in a new book uh, called Pro-Social where we were mixing act 
with uh, Lynn Ostrom's, the late Nobel Prize winning a political scientist, Lynn Ostrom's core design principles. I won't talk about that. That's an additional step. So I'm gonna yeah. take a small step in the social direction. If you're interested, if something resonates, I've taken a bigger step with my colleagues, uh, David Sloan Wilson and Paul Atkins. And uh, that book is now available uh, and you can go to prosocial.world and for free, get lots of information about how to take even additional step to do things like organizing small groups to step up to the climate uh, uh, change uh, crisis or to immigration or other things that might be important. So let me just walk through how to take psychological flexibility and socially extend it. Absolutely. Are we on board? Sound, sound yeah. like a worthwhile thing to do? Absolutely. Just before you start, um, we've got uh, Graciela Rovner saying, nice to be here. Thank you both. And um, Lara saying, uh, love that you're talking about the, the microbiome, really the future of health and mental health, in my humble opinion. So you're uh, absolutely spot on. And um, we've got Bradley saying, life is a worldwide phenomenon as is death, attachment, and avoidance. Yeah. Um, so let's carry on with uh with your stuff and we'll get back to lots of people uh you know writing in and uh but we'll try and get to them as soon as we can but again over to you uh stephen Hayes. so i'm going to socially extend each of the six psychological flexibility processes um and i want to uh, do this in a way that touches the underlying yearnings or motivation that i think are at the core of what we really want uh, inside uh the things that we do that limit our life but also inside the things that we do that expand our life. And I'll I have time to mention all six and to give a little bit of a, a shape to it. Um, I'm gonna explore this in, in more detail actually for therapists and uh, on an online course that's coming this summer that builds on one that's already available called Act Immersion. There's a new one coming uh, that will be out in uh, late June and uh, it's uh, uh, hopefully if it's of interest to you, if you're the therapist li uh, listening, there, there's a way way to go to that will kind of build on this. I've been working on it for some time. But let's start with consciousness itself. If you've read A Liberated Mind or if you've uh, dug into uh, the evolutionary basis of relational frame theory and the cognitive relations that help build out this sense of awareness, this I hear nowness of awareness that is already there even before language starts, uh, this perspective taking and uh, uh, a kind of theory of mind skills that even infants have, and that I think are so critical to developing symbolic language itself. I tell that story in a scientific article uh, called uh, Cooperation Came First. Uh, but Consciousness, being this I hear now awareness, builds on a, a, a set of cognitive relations that go beyond simply the awareness that's there uh, 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 that leads to these basic perspective taking a theory of mind skills that are these relations of I, you, here, there, now, then. And as we teach children these perspective taking relationships, Somewhere around age three or four, I hear nowness comes together. The way they come usually is person first. Young children will get I and you as two different perspectives first. Then they'll get place here and there. It's hard to learn because when you go there, there becomes here and here becomes there. It's very frustrating to kids because it's with reference to a perspective or point of view. And the last one is time, now and then. When they come together, sort of like comets whirling around, each with a bi-directional polar relationship, and they form into the I hear nowness of awareness, infantile amnesia uh, 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 occurs because we enter into a new world in which a strand of consciousness can be put the beads of memory and experience uh, on it. Because of that, uh, time, place, and person cognitive relations that are informed in uh, I hear nowness of this kind of witnessing self or observing self or spiritual self. Um, it means that we are 
in awareness itself connected in consciousness to the consciousness of others. That starts before language. I mean, when your mama gets in front of you and says, oh, you sweet baby, and looks you in the eye, you start dumping natural endorphins because you you come evolutionary prepared to be part of the group. It's important that you do. You're going to be dependent on others in infancy and we're the tribal primates. The group is going to have to be the key focus and uh, you come prepared to do that. But now with this verbal extension, this cognitive extension, this symbolic extension into this sense of the observing self, connected in consciousness to others, we have a, a possibility to extend out in, uh, uh, in our perspective taking skills into conscious connection with others to a we that's aware and to attachment and consciousness to others. I think our yearning for attachment, for secure attachments and so forth, extends into this verbal development period in the early childhood and it extends out through our, our, our whole lifetime of development. And so one of the things this means is in a way, in consciousness, we're never alone. Consciousness itself is social. It's not you that's aware, it's we that is aware and you're part of the we. You entered into the hive mind in order to be able to do what you're doing when you notice things. And sort of what that means is here in isolation, if we go to this element of consciousness, we can deliberately expand out and create our, our sense of awareness and connection to the group. So let's do a little exercise that might uh, do that. It's best done as an eyes closed exercise if you're by yourself. Uh, it's easy to do. If you're in a group with others and you're uncomfortable with closing your eyes, you can simply cover your eyes. But I, what I'd like you to do is to start out simply becoming aware of a bodily sensation. If you drift away, come back and follow the sound of my voice. But I want you to focus on a, any particular bodily sensation that you can notice. Do a little body scan, perhaps start with your feet and kind of swoop up sort of as you might if you're stepping into a hot tub where you kind of, there's a, a zone as you slide down into the tub that swoops up and eventually covers your entire body. And if you notice any part of your body stepping out as having a sensation that's distinguishable, just uh, notice that. Notice exactly where in your body you're feeling it and what it feels like. And then catch that you're noticing. Notice that you're noticing. That part of your body is not noticing itself. There's a whole human being who's listening to me right now who's noticing. And don't grab that part and look at it. What I want you to do is just touch for a second that you're here and there's a part of your total experience that involves looking from. There's a fromness to awareness. And just touch that. And then I want you to see if you could take that and let's move it around and move it around uh, different parts of the world. I want you to think about where you are and the people close, maybe in your home or in your apartment building, and what they might be doing right now, and include in that maybe some awareness of the challenges they're feeling based on this virus crisis, what they've been through, the feelings that may be associated with that. the fears that might be associated with that. And don't disappear into those. What I want you to catch instead is as you kind of move your perspective around is your awareness that there are others. It was in the background when we were talking, but put it in the foreground now, there are others not too far from you right now. 
And you might not even know who they are and a bit about what they do. And if you become aware of that, take a little moment to go behind their eyes right now or behind their aware into their awareness right now and become aware of their awareness. And then it's possible, it could happen, that right now they're also aware of you. My son is upstairs making a little bit of noise. I hope it's not recording here. I know he's on his computer playing his video games with friends. But I know he also thinks about me. And just moments ago, I said, try to remember not to tap your feet. I'll be on a podcast. And that might come to his thought. He might actually picture me right this moment talking to you. So as I'm aware of him, I want to expand out to the possibility of his awareness of me right now. And do the same thing with the people you're aware of who are close to you right now. You're known. Your existence is known to them. If you suddenly disappeared, they'd say, where did he go? Where did she go? They're tracking. And so even if you're all by yourself in front of your computer right now, you're here in a social group. And let's expand this out a bit now. It's not just the people who are close physically. We just had a little thing where Dove was walking us through who's online in Toronto or in Jerusalem or Germany. And we heard a few things from these different people. From Laura and Graciela and Amy and others. And so just for a moment, Become aware of the fact that right now you're in a very large extended group who's listening to me right now. And as I said some of those names, some of them know those names and they are now aware of people thousands of miles away right now. And some of their awareness includes their awareness of the rest of us right now, not just the ones that are named. You might know people who say, oh, I'm going to go on, I'll be on that. I think I'm going to listen to that. And some of those may be thousands of miles away, friends of yours who maybe emailed you or you emailed them. And even as I say this right now, they may be thinking of you as you are thinking of them. You are not Mm -hmm. alone. There's a we here. And I'll expand this out a little more so that we can include all of the millions and all of the billions who are right here, right now, dealing with this worldwide crisis and are facing challenges. Some are ill. And the challenge is literally the fight for their life. Others are thinking about family members who are in that situation or those who've been recently lost. Others are reading their paper and seeing the statistics go up or are contemplating whether or not to put on that mask and leave their apartment or their home. And what I want you to do is to sort of settle into, just like you did, of settling into this hot tub of awareness of your own body. Settle into this hot tub of awareness of the we. We're the social primates. We're the human beings. You were invited into this group by those sweet eyes of your mama or your dad who said, oh, you sweet baby, and you took advantage of that invitation. That's why you can listen to me now. And inside that awareness, as you expand that out, 
it is not me alone. It's we together who are facing this challenge. And so my question to you would be, as we prepare to come back in awareness, bring your tendrils back all the way back to where you're sitting now in front of this machine, being aware of your body and noticing your awareness of your thoughts and your feelings and listening to me now. I have a question for you, which is, would you be willing for part of this day to be mindful of the we so that those little decisions you make when you tend your garden or you decide whether or not to go out or you click on that little button that allows you to contribute funds to others or you think through whether or not you're going to make a call to a relative who maybe talks on too long and you'll know that it'll drag on if you do and and on and on it goes, would you be willing to bring into these little micro decisions the we that is being moved by the me? We're interconnected in consciousness right now. We have a worldwide challenge and what we decide to do together right now will bend the course of history. Your personal history the history of those you love and care about, but the history of the world itself. And could we write this history in a way that produces more compassion and connection in the world? And would you be willing to open up your heart and mind to that? There's an invitation to do it right inside your simple awareness, such as as you open your eyes right now, the awareness of what's in front of you on this screen. I had my eyes closed. So if you've been watching, you've been watching an old man with his eyes closed and his head bent down because I wanted to be more aware of the ineffable we that we live inside. That is a simple extension and a conscious connection and attachment from the I hear nowness of awareness to this more uh, uh, interconnected uh, uh, hot tub of human consciousness. I hope that was useful and I'll do a shorter version to try to live to my promise of just an hour uh, of uh, extending each of these flexibility processes. Um, but maybe uh, if there's a comment or a question, to, I'll take it here. Um... Wow, that was incredible, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I've never heard anything like that before, um, especially not in the ACT community, and this was so relevant, so relevant. In this day and age when we are, whether you call it social isolation, which is maybe a misnomer or rather a physical isolation, here you come now with the awareness of the we. This whole idea of this beehive consciousness, um, which I can only talk from my own personal experience and everybody that's watching this either now or on a replay will have their experience of what they went through with you right now. But my experience is that um, I'm alone. My children are in Israel. My mother, elderly mother's in Israel. I, I've, this is the longest I've been in a long, long time that's been separated from them from a physical point of view. And when you brought me into that kind of idea of what is, they're, they're actually, and I'm sure they are right now, thinking of me, um, they know that I'm doing this with you, so I will be in their minds, and they're in my minds when you brought that up. Um, and everybody watching this and vice versa, 
it was extremely comforting okay. to know that it is more than just me. Yeah. Right? And 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 this idea of the we that's you know, powered by the me, if you like, moved by the me. That, you know, it's incredibly powerful because sometimes you can just feel alone, you know, when you're on your own. And and that made me feel not just, yeah, I know I've got a son, I've got a mother, I've got friends, you know, that's, I know that I'm not lonely, I really do know. But it brings it into right this minute, <laughs> as if they're with me right now. Well, they are actually, they really are in some larger way. I mean, not just by content, but by connection. And, uh, you know, loneliness is an epidemic in the world. And that pandemic preceded this pandemic. You know that uh, uh, young people are a standard deviation, more anxious, depressed and stressed than they were just 30 years ago, but also that has correlated directly with their sense of loneliness that occurs right inside their smartphones and their constant uh, checking on likes and the social media and so forth. And uh, loneliness has this both a social aspect. Do I have friends I can depend on? I mean, you know that if you ask people, do you have close friends you can depend on? It keeps going down year after year after year around the world. And with the uh, modernization, as we enter into the developed world, it gets worse. And then also this emotional sense of disconnection. But we can turn it. I think the reason why people are yearning for, uh, you know, training and mindfulness, acceptance, values, and so forth, is they're trying to find something in this modern cacophony that reconnects us. And science can help. And if you, if you do it right, I think these you know, computers in our pocket instead of mocking us can actually be a tool. Right now, we're connected in this conversation. Yeah. If you can open yourself up emotionally to it, then take advantage of what is afforded by, you know, yes, we're connected, but now can we actually work on connecting? Yeah. Uh, you know, the technology allows us to be connected, but we're doing less connecting. <laughs> I think it's because we're mismanaging consciousness and the psychological processes that lead to connection. And those are the other psychological flexibility processes. Uh, this attachment and connection and consciousness is only one of six. And if you give me permission, since I uh, promised uh, about an hour, which would give me about 10 minutes to finish this, I'd like to walk through those other five in the psychological flexibility canon and show how they really have a social extension that's right there. Oh, would that be okay to turn to that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll just go through a couple of comments so that people don't feel that I've, I've left them out. And Thank then you, you can maybe incorporate some of the questions <laughs> into... Exactly what I just said. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, Miriam says, great that she could join. Catherine from England says feel like I'm in the presence of a great, and I agree with Catherine there. Truly humble to be part of this. Thank you. Um, Ruth says that she has a question for the professor. This is a question I'm asking everyone who works in mental health. What have you learned, professor, um, from your students or clients during this pandemic? Maybe you can um, touch on that when you, when, when you start talking. Um, also, Yoav says, from Israel, a big fan. Yeah. Values can change over time, can they? He's asking. And how can we really know that a client talks about values and not about his wishes or needs? What's the difference between values and wishes? Yeah. Um, Vered says, it would be an honor to host you here in Israel, and I hope... I uh, agree with her entirely. I hope I get the honor of being part of doing that for you. Um, yeah, if Avi, I can be the ACBS uh, chapter that's involved in some way, but I am looking forward to it if this ever passes and my old body can be moved around. Oh, yeah, we'll get you there somehow. Uh, Bradley says, uh, life is a worldwide phenomenon. As, oh, no, we, 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 we yeah, he's deaf. Right. Attachment avoidance. avoidance. We, we heard that. Okay, so... Um, Let's go for the next steps.
Yeah, let me see if I can uh, extend this. And those who've read and act in psychological flexibility and the therapists as well, um, I think we'll see uh, a sense. But while I won't do an exercise for each, I'll give you a little thing that you can take that's maybe practical for each. And okay. so um, let's start out with uh, this cognitive part. Uh, so we, we've done the work with consciousness and, and with that underlying uh, yearning for belonging that's inside, I argue, human consciousness. I walk that out in uh, a book, A Liberated Mind, and then these new courses. And then the cognitive piece that in the pathology version tur turns into cognitive entanglement in the helpful one and the cognitive flexibility and diffusion, our neologism for being able to look at thoughts, not just look at the world structured by our thoughts. When we socially extend those, we have the opportunity for uh, mutual understanding. The yearning that's inside uh, cognition is yearning for coherence. For, for things fitting together. In the pathological version, we try to do literal coherence where everything fits together in one grand uh, consistent uh, set of thoughts and so forth, which is a fool's errand because we're full of contradictory thoughts and of things that are being poured into us by our, our culture and our experience, some of which are not of service to us, prejudice, stigma, fears, and so on. But we can over time achieve a functional coherence of taking what's useful and leaving the rest and learning how to be guided by helpful thoughts and respectfully the decline the invitation of the mind to be guided by ones that are not helpful. When we extend that socially, we become interested in other people's thoughts and really wanting to hear them and to hear them not in a way of figuring them out and cleaning them up and making them all line up and who's right and who's wrong, but hearing them in this more diffused and open way of being able to appreciate and come to a mutual understanding. And so it, the kind of things that would be helpful there would be things like in this more open, psychologically flexible space, in our interactions, to have a little bit of time to, to say, to, for example, repeat back to people what we're hearing. So what I'm hearing you saying is, and simply say it in a way that's as non-judgmental, as purely descriptive as, as you can manage. And to explicate that uh, and, and show some appreciation for it. Like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Does that have a history? Does that thought, you have, does that connect and, where has that shown up in air, other areas of your life? Was that in your, is there a family of origin thing? Is there a, something of importance in there that's like a value for you? Of simply, in other words, entering into conversations where what's of importance is, is, is laying out the, the cognitive reality that the person you're interacting with lives inside. In English, we use the word understanding, and it literally came, apparently, I think this etymology is correct, of laying out before the kings, you know, the how the, the armies were laid out, you know, uh, explication, you know, explain. We even sort of a plane, like a flat plane, laying it out, understanding, like standing up down below, explaining. Uh, I think we can lay out and explain in a way that's not mindy and judgmental, but is open and exploratory, sort of like holding in our consciousness together a variety of thoughts and appreciating uh, that. So take your time to, to restate things that your friends or family are stating in a non-judgmental way. Make sure that you're hearing it and even ask about its history or how it amplifies without getting judgmental and coming into, you know, wait, why do you think that you should think this? Uh, if we do the same thing with affect, the underlying yearning that's there in experiential avoidance 
and in acceptance and emotional flexibility is the yearning to feel fully and without needless defense. And if you expand that out socially, what that means is compassion. I think you might have noticed a little bit in how Nuzik socially extending consciousness itself, that as we do that, we begin to see the suffering of others, to see the pain of others, to see the aspirations of others, to appreciate the joy of others. And so uh, uh, in listening, amplifying, intending to um, alleviate needless suffering, bringing ourselves into um, uh, an intentional embrace of human experience of others and asking questions about what they're feeling, how long they felt it, does that have a backstory, where has that occurred? Not in a way to figure out, judge, and eliminate and control, but as a way of sort of holding fully uh, in consciousness what it's like to be someone else with the history. What, what is, how has it been like for you to be going through this COVID crisis? and really being interested in uh, a, a compassionate embrace of the other person's experience. If we extend attentional processes, contacting the, the now in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary into others, uh, into our, our, the we, you know, then we have the capacity for uh, joint attention, the yearning that's inside these attentional processes is orientation to sort of know what's up, to know what's here. And we can notice what's up here between us. What's here in the betweenness right now? Is that going on right now between us? And asking about how things are landing cognitively and socially from this point of consciousness sets up that conversation to have a joint attention of the, the we interaction that's occurring in a way that's not dominated by problem solving, but is dominated more by the mode of mind that you bring to seeing a sunset or listening uh, to the suffering of a child. So, so joint attention is a place that we can go. Motivation, values. In the psychological flexibility work, there's a yearning for meaning and purpose. We mismanage that when we turn it over to materialism, to, to, to applause, to uh, mindless self-soothing, to self-gratification, and instead connect with the qualities of being and doing that we want to put into our lives. When we extend that socially, we open up the possibility of joint values, relationship values, family values, community values, neighborhood values, values of our nation, values of the world. And they're, they're naturally nested in that way. And so what is the we values that we wanna produce inside this COVID crisis? I think what we're doing right now by just being here and having this discussion and by being part of a series of things that Dev has set up, out of his concern, out of his values, we're sort of entering into a social values game right now. And we can do that consciously as we create small groups, organizations, etc. You know, what are we doing inside our clinic? What are we doing inside our business? What are we doing inside our church group? And so on. And so Taking the time, if you're used to the kind of matrix way of thinking about values, of looking at what you would want to move toward, it's on the inside and it shows up on the outside. Don't just do it for the me, do it for the we. And this uh, sense of shared values and acknowledgement of each other's values in community builds us up. And I think it helps actually answer one of the questions that came earlier, because uh, you'll find it difficult to do that with mindy, um, automatic, mindless kind of goals and self-gratification. They just don't translate socially, but real values do. There's a quality of being and doing that you admire. That's why one reason, that one way that you get to values is think about who are your guides and heroes. 
if you really look at that, that's one of the four big ways I know of sweet, sad heroes and stories that take you into values. If you don't know what I'm talking about, some of these other sources I've mentioned will t walk you into that. But when you think of a hero, like who would be your model for how to handle the coronavirus? I bet you, you see in there values that you would like to put into your behavior. So in the same way that the me of consciousness comes from the social we of community and the verbal community that brought you in, the we really comes first. The me doesn't come first. The same is true with values. Values are part of us. And yes, you own it. Yes, you cho choose. Yes, that's what really makes them uh, alive. But no, they're not uh, selfish and alone and cut off. Uh, values have to do with the human communities in which you're raised. And so taking the time to socially extend and acknowledge will help you see the parts of meaning and purpose that are true to this kind of uh, uh, psychological flexibility meaning of what meaning is. And then the final one is competence. You know, the final yearning uh, that's there inside the psychological flexibility model is committed action, where the a commitment is to larger and larger habits of values-based action and being willing to go through the one step at a time skill building steps it takes to learn how to get more and more ingrained in, you know, by practice and pattern, by re repetition and by linkage to larger groupings of actions to build habits of, of values-based uh, action, the commitment and committed action is to that. And so instead of mindlessly uh, procrastinating or getting busy for no purpose or grasping or you know, wanting to be competent simply by springing forth from the head of Zeus, we humbly walk through the one step at a time pattern of building uh, our committed action skills. Well, when we socially extend that, we now take advantage of our cooperative nature, which is the source of all of this, I believe. It's the source of human language and cognition itself. And uh, I've written about that and I've uh, uh, walked through some of the science of that. You can put that into now shared commitments. And it's not by accident that when you have an individual commitment and you say it out loud to others, it now becomes much more real. In the same way, when we socially extend, we can ask what are we committed to? What are we committed to as a, a human community, but down in all of our subgroupings? Dove kindly talked about the feeling that he had from the ACBS community, the Contextual Behavioral Science or ACT community of generosity and so forth. You know, that has been put into our community one step at a time by taking the psychological flexibility model, organizing our very organization around it, taking the time to produce a more accepting, cognitively open, conscious, connected approach to things that is values-based. And in all these tiny little ways of listening, allowing other people's voices to come in, values-based dues. I mean, if you know about our organization, forgive me for making it an example, but I think it is a good example. We've been able to create a cultural practice of generosity that could be lost. It's not automatic. You, if you do it mindlessly, it will be lost. But when you bring these values-based choices into these habits, you can create community habits. You can create social habits. You can do that. You're doing that all the time in your relationships, in your family, but you can do it in your business. You can do it in your clinic. You can do it in your neighborhood. You can do it in your nation. You can do it in the world. And, you know, this is the deal, I think. We are on a multi-generational, several hundred year journey to evolve as human beings, to create a culture and a science that affords us in, uh, uh, with our scientific knowledge, greater and greater success in building a compassionate and supportive and, and psychologically uplifting world. I think when we 
get beyond the kind of me, me, me into a we based focus on what are the processes that help do that, then we can get less concerned about is it called act or is it called this or that or who are our heroes and instead focus on what are the processes that make a difference in human lives and can, and whether or not we're remembered for that, whether or not there's a label we can cling to or a little you know side business we can create really is not important. All boats will rise, but let's keep our eye on the prize, which is how to create, uh, in the case of uh, our, our work with ACT, a behavioral science more adequate to the challenge of the human condition. And I think we are making progress, and the we is not just the ACT people, but behavioral scientists more, more generally, in the service of what? In the service of the human community more generally. and. Uh, you know, this COVID crisis is a good uh, place to apply that knowledge and also a good kind of crucible for whether or not that knowledge is really useful. So far, it appears to be, and I hope uh, this way of thinking of how to extend the psychological flexibility processes you find useful in your therapy work, if you're a, a clinician or a practitioner, and if you're uh, uh, just a person at large out there, I hope you pursue a bit about the knowledge about psychological flexibility and start focusing on how to socially extend it so that it empowers your families, community, businesses, and the world. And so maybe that's a place we can do a little bit of a chat. I went a little longer than an hour, but only by a few minutes. And I, I hope you see how you can do it. You can extend these social, you can extend these psychological flexibility processes socially. Uh, if All boats will rise. Um, I, when I asked you to come on board here to uh, give a nano workshop, what I did not expect was a mega world-class uh, workshop, and I really do appreciate it, and I think everybody else does. I'm not going to speak. I want to hand it over to a few comments. So we've got um, Alon Dangor says, thank you, Professor. Um, Kath says, completely blown away, Very, very feel very moved. Um, Ruth is saying, I love that you're reminding us to reconnect on a social level. I thought that was really interesting exercise. I experienced a sense of aloneness and then reconnect to the we. Powerful. Absolutely. I, I, really, really touching people. Nikki uh, Lachs says, thank you. That was wonderful as you took us on a journey of expansion to include so many others. I just sense this wider and wider smile uh, on my lips. Absolutely. Um, the, 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 yeah, somebody is saying here something that I was going through my mind. I will re-listen to this. Absolutely. I'm definitely going to be going over this again and again. Um, Nikki says, thank you so much. Totally inspiring. And uh, indeed, it's been totally inspiring. Inspiring, and uh, there is so many other comments that we're going to leave them. You can have a look at them. We can have a look at them on the Facebook page uh, afterwards. Um, I cannot take up much more of your time. I know you have uh, a busy schedule, but I um, really appreciate every second that you uh, gave over to us. Again, it just just shows the generosity, but not only the time factor, the depth. That um, renewal of information, of, of ideas for me, of this expansion of the social conscience, I really, really um, attach myself to that. It's something that's very, very special to me, especially under the circumstances that I'm living in. But it will certainly help me with um, the people that I work with and my colleagues and uh, my clients. And... Uh, Stephen C. Hayes, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you and, and with your uh, viewers and listeners. And uh, I would ask if you were moved by this to just think about how you might uh, amplify it in your own groups by helping people through this time because people are suffering. These flexibility skills are not known to all. They're in our wisdom traditions, our spiritual traditions, they're in our scriptural texts, etc. But so many 
people are in the modern world getting lost. They're drowning in commercialism and in materialism and in temptations to things that are the exact opposite of what science shows creates a, a healthy, uh, a healthy psychological uh, approach to your own life and your ability to connect with others. And so we, we have to get busy. We have work to do and the we is all of us and the target of the work is all of us. So um, if, if it was something moving, I hope it moves you in that uh, direction. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, Unashamedly, um, I have my copy here and I recommend it to everybody. I'm very privileged to have a signed copy and I'm proud yeah, of it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stanley. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.